Thank you all for having me here today. My name is Joellen Fox. I am at the Dan Aaron Parkinson Center in Center City, Philadelphia. And just a little bit of background information from where I am. Um, Center City, a small outpatient clinic of five therapists, two physical therapists, two speech language pathologists, one of which is here, Marissa, and one occupational therapist. We are a multidisciplinary clinic. And unlike a lot of orthopedic outpatient sites, we see individuals one-on-one -on -one for one hour. So we get to know people quite well. And also, of all the patients whom we see, 90% or above have Parkinson's or atypical Parkinson's. So we like to call ourselves a specialty. And we see people from all over the area. So it's very exciting. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you've been at your clinic four years, Marissa, five. Heather Sancy, who established it, um, over f almost 15 years now. Don't you get burnt out? Don't you see the same thing every day? And as the doctors mentioned earlier, everybody's different. So truly, we never see the same thing every day. So my idea today um, is to teach you a little bit about the role of physical therapy in the fight of Parkinson's disease. A lot of people think of physical therapists as the exercisers, the people who know the body, the anatomy, and yes, we do. Now, unlike um, somebody after a joint replacement or somebody who sprains or strains a muscle, I can't make your MSA go away, but I can help you work better, function better, feel better, even though you have MSA. So do we officially ever really discharge somebody from physical therapy? We'd like to say no. It's the end of a chapter of a book. Thank you, Marissa. Very good. The end of a chapter of a book, and you're going to come back for your next chapter later on because life continues and things change. So some of the talking points that I'd like to discuss today include transfer techniques, equipment, posture, exercise, tips for you, tips for the caregivers around you, and just an overall kind of initiative, motivation to just fight. Everybody sitting here is in a different stage, a different level, a different part of life, a different age. So everybody here is different. So some of these things may apply to you. And if they don't apply to you, keep them in the back of your brain. It's prehabilitation. Start thinking about these things now. Start getting yourself in a good mindset, mindful movement, as we like to call it in our clinic. Because you don't have to wait until a problem arises. Why do that? Start thinking about it now and push it off so that you don't have to deal with it sooner. So one thing. Um, let's start with what we all do first thing in the morning. First thing this morning for a lot of us in Philadelphia was waking up at 5 a.m. to be here. But as Dr. Chemensky was talking about this morning, orthostatic hypotension, change of position. Well, we change position all day long when we get up first thing in the morning, when we get out of the chair because it's break time and the food's out and I want to get in line. But do you think about the way you get up? No. You're thinking about heading to the bathroom because you just woke up. You're thinking about getting the food before the brownies run out. We never really think about our movement because it's been automatic. But if you break it down and start to think about your movement, you can improve your movement. Perfect example is a lot of people whom we see with MSA who come into the clinic that say, I have difficulty getting out of bed, demonstrate what we call a scoop to sit transfer where they basically are just moving the whole body as a unit to get out of bed. And the whole body isn't a unit. We have individual parts, arms connected to the trunk, connected to the legs. It's like a big run-on sentence, a big blurred movement. And a lot of times, there's difficulty with that movement. It may take longer. It may be painful. You may feel unbalanced. You may feel lightheaded. So what we like to do is part training. Break it down. Think about the movement specifically. So if you're asleep on your back, bend your knees first. Number one, it'll help reduce the tightness that you may feel on your back when you first wake up in the morning. Take a bend to those knees. Stretch out those muscles. Roll onto your side. Take a breath. Then kick your legs off. And then slowly push up to sit. It's a very thought out process. But believe it or not, even taking the time to think through those steps, you will be able to get out of bed more efficiently than if you just tried to automatically. Now, it's a lot to think about first thing in the morning when you just want to get up to get out of bed. A lot of times we have just a simple sheet that people place next to the bed. 
Somebody next to you, remember to bend your knees, your spouse, partner. But it works, and it's helpful. Other things Dr. Chemensky had talked about, you know, stacking, did you hear him say the bricks? Put the bricks under your bed. I saw a couple people's eyes, bricks? Where does he want bricks in bed? Well, bricks underneath the legs of the bed, you know, at the top where your head is to angle the bed up. Now, we all may not have bricks accessible. We, not, we all may not be able to lift the bed up. What you can also do, and something everybody can do this evening, if you sleep with two pillows on top of one another underneath the head, make them a T. The first pillow starts at the small of your back and comes up, and the second pillow is behind your head. By doing that, you've now elevated yourself about 10 degrees. You can also buy a wedge. So it's seen a lot of times in therapy. They have wedges. You can get that. Again, you're lifting yourself up from the hips, which again is elevating your heart and not the bed so that your spouse is also getting that same effect. So it's a way without doing sleep number or craftmatic for you both to sleep comfortably, but differently and still applying that. Other things, a lot of times people may bring up a bed rail and people will say to us, well, I, I don't fall out of bed. Why do I need a bed rail? You know, they immediately think of child safety and a whole thing that's locking in. They make some that are literally even half that length and distance. It's literally like a, a horseshoe at the end of the bed. It's simply something there to support, to push, to have. Number one, it's almost a placebo effect for some people. Knowing it's there makes them feel better, which is great. Number two, it's a reminder to roll onto your side first and you have it there something to push up from rather than reaching towards your end table to help grab and pull yourself away. If you do have a lot of tightness or have a lot of issues with your posture and you have a tendency to feel a little unsteady as you're reaching towards that night table to get the phone or get uh, papers, anything, the remote control for the TV, something you can put things in so that you're not reaching beyond your bed for something and potentially lose your balance. So it's a neat little trick and something that we use. And now since unfortunately summer is over, another tip we'll often say, in the wintertime people all the time will say, I just can't move around in bed. It's just, I feel like there's too much on me. Well, rather than having all those blankets on top of you, wear a heavier pajama to bed. This way there's lighter things on top of you, but you're still warm, so that's another tip. Other things, and here's a perfect example in this banquet room. Lovely chairs, but none of them have armrests. Which, what's the next thing you do? You reach forward for the table to help pull you up. A lot of times people will come in to see us, and objectively we look at them and say, yep, you're moving around independently, you're getting out of chairs independently, you are getting out of bed independently, but are you doing it safely? That might be where your caregiver partner comes in and says, you know what, you make me nervous when you get out of that chair. It looks like you're going to fall. Don't you think you could do that better? But again, when do you think about getting out of a chair? Only if it's difficult or you can't. The tough thing about getting out of a chair is you're fighting gravity. And we are all different heights. And we all have different things with us on top of MSA. You may have arthritis in your knees. You may have a bad back. You may have broken your wrist 10 years ago and can't really use it to push off from. So realize different ways to fight gravity include just put a carry around a cushion that you can place in a seat. Okay, think of that at home if you have a couch that you'd love to sit in and you don't want to part with. Well, rather than just sitting on that initial cushion that sinks down, Fold up a blanket, put that on the chair. You're higher up. It's better, so you can still sit on that couch that you enjoy. And again, rather than letting it be automatic, leave yourself a post-it note that has a, just one word, think, okay? Remember, you know, where, what I tell people, a lot of times we'll say, you know, put a rubber band on. Every time you look at the rubber band, you'll remember the therapist saying, you gotta look up when you walk, or one of our tips. Just have a little reminder next to the chair you always have difficulty getting out of. Remember these things. Scoot to the edge of the chair first. Break down the task. Don't try to just get up. A lot of times when people get up, and I do it myself, and it's the one time I trip, which is why I didn't wear heels today, because it's inevitable that it happens. If I'm in the clinic and I know my patient's there and I rush to get up, 
Do I ever stand up straight first? No, it's a blurred movement, and it looks so unsteady. I'm getting up and I'm going because I'm not thinking of the act of getting up. I'm thinking of going to what I'm thinking about. So rather, think about the act of getting up, scooting to the edge of the chair, transferring my weight forward, stop and stand tall, and then take a step. And then you have control of your movement and not gravity. So that's another tip. So moving on, car, another tough spot. People come in and say, they come in in all different types of cars, I just can't get out of the car. Somebody has to grab me out of the car. Or it's just difficult, do you have any tricks for the car? Well, number one, leather seats are easier to kind of maneuver on. Not all of us have the advantage of having leather. One thing you could do is put a plastic bag on the upholstered seat, it can help with gliding. Number two, again, think about the act of getting out of a car. To be sitting in a car and bring one leg out and shift that weight over is a really difficult motion to do. Take the time to get both legs out, lean forward, and stand up. If it's difficult, if you are so tight that you can't get the legs out, they make lifty, nifty things like this swivel seat that goes on there. And it's a disc, and you can literally jam out and just rock all day long. Good for abs, you know, just swivel. Um, very helpful. They make something called the handy bar. Believe it or not, it was as seen on TV. All right, 1995. Shipping and handling free. Um, I don't know, you can probably get a better price online. But what it does, in the door jam of the car, a lot of times, hey, I don't want to lean forward to grab the car door because that's unstable. The chair is too low, so I'm not getting leverage. The dash is awkward, so there's really no good place to reach besides, okay, hubby, I'm going to grab you. And that's not good either. This goes right in the door jam. You swing both legs out, you scoop forward, and you have leverage, safe leverage, to push up from. And then you take it out of the door jam and also keep it in your pocketbook in case you drive off a bridge because it can also smash a window in the event. They do advertise that. Okay, posture. Dr. Golby brought up something called the Pisa effect. We see two things commonly with MSA in the clinic. I'm a huge person about posture. It's my soapbox. It's the foundation of everything, I think, no matter what the diagnosis is. But with MSA, what we typically see in people is either a lean to the side or a drawing forward. Now, I will tell you all that you are all sitting there and you are all drawn forward because that's what we typically do during a day. We are writing. We are on a computer. We are watching television. We are listening to somebody speak. There are very few activities that we do daily, functionally, where we are extended and we are tall, unless you work in our clinic, okay? So it is important to remind yourself to be taller. How are you sitting right now? Everybody sit up taller, feet apart, feet are flat on the ground. You know, when we cross our legs, you immediately slump. That pelvis just rotates, shifts back, and boom, not good. If you're my mother, you're going to tape my shoulder blades together to remind me. She did it. Also, downward gaze. It's these things. If you hold a posture, if you've worked in a cubicle for 30 years and been at a computer, you aren't going to have the best posture unless you are really, really in tune to it. So it's what you do on a daily basis that reinforces your posture. If you don't have a good chair that you sit in at home, if you tend to sit more than you do move, all of those things you need to think about. But typically what we see is either that lean to the side, that head where the chin starts to drop down, okay, the rounded out back up top, and then ultimately what ends up happening is those hamstrings get really darn tight. And hamstrings are a real pain to stretch. And believe it or not, they really impact the way in which you walk. Flexibility is key to movement. And when we lose flexibility outside of the realm of MSA, but rather just with aging, 
when we lose flexibility as we age, it impacts balance. And what's the key cardinal thing we want to avoid? Falls. So again, prehabilitation, it's not an issue now. You can correct your posture when somebody's in front of you telling to sit up taller, but you need to address it now so that it's not a problem down the road. So where does the weight move? If I am standing up nice and tall and I want to take a big step forward, anatomically, I can clear that leg forward. If I am shifted forward, rounded out, and I'm forward here, anatomically, my femur in my hip, it doesn't have as much motion. I am blocking myself to take a big step. And therefore, I am going to take smaller steps, and therefore, I'm going to use more energy because I just took 25 steps to go a distance I could have taken eight. So it's, again, it's efficiency, and it's mindful movement. So you want to think of that plumb line, I keep losing that, hanging down. That ear should be aligned with the shoulder, which should be aligned in the hip, knee, and heel. That is perfect posture right there. And it's very hard to attain. But think about it, because as soon as you forward flex, you're resisting gravity, and your muscles are doing harder work. And you want to save that, those muscles for things you enjoy doing, not just trying to maintain balance standing up or sitting down. Other things that you can do to help propping. I saw a woman already today who had a prop alongside her chair to help her sit up tall. Excellent. Excellent. You're on top of it. Yes, you need to do those things. If you have a tendency to lean over to the right and you sit on the right side of your sofa or your table's on the right side, no, you're going to the other side. If you have a family member who tends to sit to the right, don't sit on the right side of them. Sit on the left side of them. It forces them to look at you, to try to shift the weight. And yeah, it's going to be difficult and hard, but it's an exercise just even in that. Other things, how many pillows do you sleep with? Oh, the downward head that we often see, I can't tell you. I asked the person, how many pil pillows, please? I said, you're going to make me cringe. And the three, four, <gasps> Try, try to take it away. Reduce it. Every other night, if you're sleeping with three pillows, do three pillows, two pillows, three pillows, two pillows. The next week, try to do two pillows Monday through Friday. Try to wean yourself off the pillows. Okay? And try that T that I mentioned. So rather than pillows stacked, weave the pillows. This way you're propping that trunk, your upper trunk, and not just your head. Because number one, it affects the musculature. Number two, if that musculature gets tight, it's going to infect a lot of other things, some of which Marissa is going to talk about. The recliner. That's the next thing that gets people all the time. I have men that will come in and, yeah, my back's been killing me for decades, and now I've got this diagnosis. I just want to sleep in my Barker lounger. Well, I'll tell you what, when they lay down on the mat, it's like they're still in their recliner, they're so tight. Get out of the recliner. Maybe this, wean yourself away from the recliner a little bit, okay? You can still keep the recliner in there, but wean yourself away. You just have a tendency to, it's, your pelvis is going to shift back and you're going to get really tight. So you got to find another chair, a second favorite that you can spend some time in. So choose to help yourself. Great chairs are chairs that have armrests, are chairs that have tall backs. You can just sit taller, be taller. You can still elevate your legs. You can still put a stool underneath your feet, but you'll have better overall posture because you won't sink into that C-shaped spine. You'll have things to promote a tall, tall posture. And again, I saw somebody correct themselves back there. It's just awareness. If you're comfortable, it means you don't have the best posture you could have. You have to work for it, okay? And avoid, again, like I said before, crossing your legs. Roll up a dish towel from the kitchen and place it right at those two bony points in your back, at your pelvis. And that'll be a nice little kick to shift you forward. Okay, on your drive home, go into one of the hotel rooms and take a towel and try it on your way home. No, but 
in the car. You know, there's some fancy cars right now that have a little button that all of a sudden you have a lumbar support. They're excellent, but not all cars have those. You can use a towel for that. And again, this isn't just good for people with MSA. It's good for everybody. And again, don't wait until you have a problem or pain. Do it now. All right, prehab. Remind yourself. Tuck that chin. I mean everybody right now. Everybody's looking forward and I have a long neck and the first thing that happens is this. I tell people, give yourself a double chin. It's the thing we hate to do, but do it. Pull back. Feel that stretch in the neck. Our cervical spine has two areas, lower cervical and upper cervical. What ends up happening is people spend a lot of time or the head shifts down and then they come to me and they're looking up. So sure, the upper cervical can extend, but the lower cervical is flexed. And then they get a lot of strain and a lot of pain. Okay, so it's that ability to cue yourself to flatten out that whole neck. And everybody, pinch your shoulder blades back. Imagine like there's a pencil there you're trying to hold. Automatically, you gain a half inch. The whole room grew taller, okay? That type of thing. Put a post-it somewhere. If you know you go to your desk a lot, leave a post-it that says shoulder blades, you know, posture. I had one guy, and he, he had just Parkinson's disease, young guy, but the worst posture ever. And he worked on the computer all day long, so he actually set an alarm on his computer, and it was a flash of an image, and it was just a reminder for posture. Another guy set a, a thing on his phone, so every time the phone went off, he knew he had to fix his posture. Little things like that are really helpful. Posture affects the walking, and I gave that demo earlier. It truly, truly does. And as we go into a discussion about different things to help you walk, that lateral shift, that side bend, that tightness on the one side can also affect the use of a walker where you may find your feet are outside or off to the edge of the wheels and things like that. And we'll talk about that. One of the things that was on that intro page about things I was going to talk about was freezing, and it's also mentioned here. It's not something that occurs in winter. Has anybody experienced it, the freezing that occurs with gait? Ah. And it's not just freezing that occurs with gait. It can be freezing with movement initiation, just trying to start to move, trying to roll in bed, trying to simply shift your weight to look at somebody that may be calling you, and we're going to talk a lot about that. So, has anybody, and this is another question for the group, has anybody noticed that the muscles in their legs have changed, that your legs look different than they did a while ago? So, normal gait has these phases. In the ankle, you have a contact, a mid stance, and a propulsive phase where you're pushing off through the foot. So now, two part, think of flexibility where we start to get tight in the hamstring and calf. Now compound that with the disease where you don't articulate from the ankle as much. And that's gonna completely change your walk. If you're not pushing through that foot, in this type of pattern, you're not going to use the musculature in your legs as you once did. A lot of times we see atrophy in the calf. Because, for example, if you have, whoops, that MSA, where you have more of that ataxia and that cerebellar problem where you have a wider stance, you're using more of your hips and trunk to advance the leg. You're not really getting propulsion through the ankle. If you have the MSA where it's more of that Parkinsonian symptomology where you're forward and you're shuffling, again, that ankle isn't pushing. So what are things we as therapists do to help try to articulate and get some push? We have a great new thing in our clinic that arrived this summer, which is called a light gate. It's a body-weighted supported system so I can harness a person up and with straps correct their posture and then take their weight out of their legs and then move their legs and try to get them to push and change their gait pattern, think about their movement. When was the last time you had to think about walking? You know, again, it's something that's automatic. So you're retraining your brain 
to return to this phase to try to use your muscles in a better pattern, a pattern that helps more with balance, a pattern that elicits a better posture, a pattern that's just safer overall. And it's hard to do. When toddlers first start to walk, it's estimated that they walk nine football fields a day. It's amazing because they practice. It's innate, it's natural as we learn to walk. Well, you've got to return to the practice. Okay, if something's changed in your walk that's due to something neurological, you can retrain your brain and think about the pattern. But it's impossible to always think, you know, the phone rings, you're, you're thinking about dinner, and that's where the role of your loved ones, the other notes comes in, they're coaching. They're not nagging, they're coaching. So keep that in mind. But it's something that we in therapy really focus on. So it's that thoughtful movement to think from head to toe. We always start out at the foundation. We are always looking at what's happening in the ankle first, and then we work up the chain. What's happening in the knee? What's happening in the hips? Where is the trunk and where is the gaze? And if it all falls into place, or at least gets better, it really can impact how you move. Not only in the efficiency of your walk, but also the speed of your movement and the balance of your movement. Whoop. So equipment, we had a wonderful rep outside, Charles, who had some interesting pieces of equipment, and you all here have a varied array of equipment. I have seen a three-wheeled rollator, a four-wheeled rollator, common items. There is something called a laser cane, which is used a lot in freezing of gait, which I'll talk to. This is a U-step. How many people had seen a U-step before today? A few, okay. A lot of people, um, well, not a lot, but some people will come in and have a tendency to be falling forward where the weight's shifting forward and have difficulty controlling with that, which makes the use of a rollator tough because it's zooming away from you. The idea of the U-step, thanks, Charles. Charles is going to demo, is that when you walk with it, you have to squeeze the brakes to go. And unlike a rollator, the U-step weighs 27 pounds, 26, 27 pounds. A rollator, a four-wheeled rollator, weighs about 11 to 13 pounds, depending on the style you get. So this has more weight, so it's holding you back, all right? They also can come equipped with a laser light, so that you have that light on the bottom as a reminder to take bigger steps or to get your heel to that first. Um, He's like the Vanna White, the male version. That's great. Um, you can also sit on it. It can also come with a metronome, which is an auditory cue to increase step length, heel strike, cadence, um, which is also something we use. There are also rollators similar to the one at the top. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> similar to the one at the top that have reverse brakes. So they're the same weight as a rollator, but... Similar to the U-step, you have to squeeze to get them to go. And when you let go, they break. The idea of using that is typically when somebody's losing their balance, they let go of their grip. And therefore, it's going to stop. So you're not going to lose your balance forward. So it comes in handy for that. Why I like to recommend equipment like this for people is because a lot of times people will say, I don't go out in the community anymore because... What if I can't make it? What if there's not somewhere for me to sit? You always have a chair, so you can theoretically always go out. And getting out in the community is the best thing for you. Staying home and seeing the same things day to day, not good stimulation for the brain, the mind, or the body, okay? It is also great because of the rotatory wheels in the front, it moves with you. So if you do have a tick or some type of muscular contraction that's throwing you off balance, it's going to go with you. If you have a standard two-wheeled rolling walker where the wheels are fixated and going forward back, it doesn't move with you. You physically have to lift, and that can sometimes cause people to trip. The three-wheeled rollator is something that's a little less helpful than the four-wheeled. It's also less cumbersome. Um, I, it's something that where you just need a little extra support. 
Keep in mind, if you are using or recommended to use any of these devices, you do not need to push them. If you are holding on to them, they are going to move with you. Commonly, people want to push. You don't have to push, okay? You just have to hold on to and keep good posture. A lot of times when teaching people how to use these initially, I'll put towels underneath their armpits and we walk and see how far you can go before you lose the towels. If you've lost the towels, it means your arms aren't where they should be. You got to keep them tucked to your side. Now, in mobility and balance might be compromised to an extent where you may need a chair. There are different styles of chair. One is transport chair, super lightweight, um, something that you perhaps could push yourself. There are some that have brakes here so that you can then lock them down and if you need to take a seat, you go and take a seat and then perhaps can wheel yourself via walking of the feet. There are also obviously bigger chairs, electric chairs. That's something that you need to see a therapist truly for because there's a wheelchair seating clinic. Everybody is a different weight, a different height, and has a different array of orthopedic underlying things. Cardi I mean, all different stuff. So a lot goes into decision making with those type of chairs from the type of seat to the width to the depth to the weight. And it needs to be customized to you. Because, and if people have questions, I can address it at the Q&A. This equipment, the whole thing is, well, who's going to pay for it? You know, it doesn't come free. Well, if you have Medicare, Medicare pays for one piece of equipment every five years that's related to mobility. So when people come in and they want to get a walker, okay, which is downwards of $150 and less, I will say to them, try to round up. Is your birthday coming up? Can people, you know, put into a fund? Try to purchase that out of pocket because you may have an expenditure coming up that's a lot more money that you're going to want insurance to kick in for, okay? So, you know, if you have individual questions, my cards are out there and I can talk to that. Freezing of gait. A lot of times why we bring up using an assistive device because a lot of times when people have freezing of gait, they have falls. Freezing of gait is a motor phenomenon. In people with Parkinson's, it's been observed for a very long time. It's an actual motor block where you physically cannot move, okay? And it's called that freeze. People with MSA also, particularly more of that MSAP, have more common experiences with this. This does happen to them. Um, it's usually unpredictable. It doesn't really depend on if it's a good day or a bad day or a specific time of day. But a lot of times there are triggers. It might be a change in surface, a doorway, a narrow space. It may just be when every time I'm trying to get up out of that chair, trying to go into the kitchen, it happens. And it could be the style of which you're trying to move. You may be getting up and turning those shoulders very quickly rather than doing that part-by-part -part training. Ultimately, it's that body's, it's like you sh had a short circuit and the brain isn't sending the signal down to the feet to shift your weight anymore. And therefore, if you can't shift weight off of a foot, you can't advance the foot. If you can't shift weight off the side of your body and you're lying in bed, you're not going to be able to roll to the other side of your body. Likewise, if your weight is centered in your trunk and you're co-contracting abs and back, you're not going to be able to rotate to look at somebody who's talking to you. So what do you do about it? A lot of people try to just fight it because obviously it's a problem and obviously I want to move, so they just try to push themselves out of it. Well, you're pushing out of it via the part of the body that isn't being affected by it. So if you've frozen with the feet and you've try, you're trying to fight, so you bring those shoulders forward, the shoulders are moving, but the feet still aren't. The feet start to move because gravity's taken hold, so you don't have control of the movement. The best thing to do, and it's something we developed in the clinic, four S's. It's amazing when you say to a person, stop, how they just fix their posture. You say, stop and they stand tall, they lift their head, they look at you, and it shifts that weight back. There's been something that's occurred in the way you've shifted your weight that shorted the circuit. You need to stop the movement, and it may not be something, stopping movement may not be an incredibly visible movement. It may be something slight. You stop the movement, you stand tall. So think of shoulders over hips, head is lifted, 
you shift your weight side to side, feel your feet. It's an interesting comment to make to people. Feel your feet. What are they doing? Where's the weight? And then take a big step. Four S's. A lot of times, you know, people who would have freezes, that's my grandmother. I'm just kidding. (laughs) People who have freezes in the home, I'll put up a stop sign and have them place that in the home so that it's, again, the reminder, stop. There's an S. It's the first S of the four S's. Do it. Think about it. So, exercise. This was a hot topic. Tom left. Where did he go? Um, Exercise is a key thing. All right. I like that picture. I use it often because, hello, flexibility. I mean, we all need it, but my oh my. Um, exercise is fantastic. Why I, where I always like to start are the postural stretches. I mean, they're huge. They're sometimes boring, but they're very important. Okay, stretching, very, very good. And honestly, it's like a habit. It's like making coffee every morning, you know, before you start your day. You weren't doing that in childhood. It was a habit you developed, so develop that habit of stretching in the morning. Okay, just get it started. Tai Chi has been something that there's been a lot of research in. Why? Because it's weight shifting. And it's a lot of body awareness. And it can be modified depending on you as a person. And it's breathing. Um, It's relaxing. It's a very good means of exercise. And it's challenging. It can be very challenging. Lower extremity strength training. So, again, if you're not using your muscles the way you once did, you know that premise, if you don't use it, you lose it? Same thing applies. So if you're not using those muscles the same way, they're not going to stay healthy. They're going to get weaker. So, again, a lot of times where we see it is in the legs, typically, honestly, more so in the hips because you start to compensate using your trunk a lot more and you use your legs less. Now... There is a key thing that falls into exercising that can complicate things, and that is that orthostatic hypotension. So it's something that the therapist needs to work with and be aware of and also may have to modify exercise. So for some people, they may do a lot of their lower extremity training on a mat, semi-inclined with the low back and just getting those legs to move. Some people are best appropriate for exercise in the pool, and I believe it was... One of the docs this morning who did have water exercise or pool exercise, I think, was on his slide. That's another great avenue if you have severe orthostatic hypotension. You can still work around it. Aqua jogging was what he had on there. A great thing. Ultimately, no matter what, exercise has to be meaningful to you. If you don't like the exercise, you're not going to do it. Even though you know it's good for you, Everybody has good intentions. Everybody does. And I know people will come into the clinic and they will talk a good game and then they come back with their spouse and the spouse just says, he didn't do it. Nope. Mm -mm." Well, it has to have meaning to you. So it's, if you have a fit, buddy system is great. You know, if you have a spouse, a friend that goes for walks or enjoys tennis or going to the gym, you know, do that goes to the pool because you're more likely to cancel on yourself than cancel on somebody else. It's also very easy to follow along to a DVD or Comcast on on demand exercise and fitness, Tai Chi, for free. It's very difficult to take a handful packet of exercises given by your therapist and lay them out and do them all. You're just not going to do it the same as you do in therapy when you're performing for a therapist. When you perform for yourself, you don't have as, you know, much high-end, you know, expectations. So think of that. And honestly, that's where the therapist comes in and gets creative because it truly has to be individualized to you and you have to like it. I can't tell you how many times, you know, we take speech and therapy together and we have people dancing in the clinic and singing songs. People bust the moves and then really start to work on the voice. It's, it's very interesting, but they enjoy it, and it's fun, and they can dance with their spouse, and it's good. Intensity was a question brought up earlier. Just because you have MSA doesn't mean you have to stop being you. 
It doesn't mean you have to stop being doing the things that you once did in the gym or lower the intensity. Now, if your doctor says, I'm going to give you some exercise restrictions, that's different because remember, everybody's different. You may have something going on in your cardiac system, lungs, joints, who knows? So, you know, always be aware and run things through your doctor. But if you are cleared for exercise, there is nothing you cannot do. Realize the body needs recovery. So there was one question with intensity. Yeah, you got to give your body some recovery. The body also likes variation. Doing the very same thing day to day is not good for the body. You're not going to make any progress. It's like going to a gym for five years and I say, see this guy at the gym and his body hasn't changed at all because he does everything wrong, number one. But he's doing the same thing every day at the gym. You've seen him. You know, you're just running through the regime because again, where's that expectation? Where's that push? Okay, give yourself the daily agenda. If you're retired, all the more reason. Build out your day. Hey, you know, from eight to four, we're going to this conference today. From six to six thirty, I'm going to do my tai chi. Check it off your list. Guaranteed, you feel productive. Make goals for yourself at the end of the week so that hey, if I do, if I stick to my agenda. All throughout the week, I'll go to the movies. I'll buy myself that top. I'll do, you know, that type of thing. But if you write it down and it's on a list to do, it's work. Identify it as work. It's work for yourself. Okay, one more tip. And this is, again, music. I mean, we pull in so many different things. There's such good research out there. There is a definite push in the last 10 years to show how exercise is neuroprotective. They are scanning the brain pre and post exercise, and it is showing changes, changes in the neural makeup of the brain. Do it. Come see a therapist to show you how to, because, and it's never the wrong time to start. Now is the time to start. You must. Um, so listen to music when you go home tonight. Turn it on and move to the music. It's amazing when you try to give your body rhythm how it changes things, how it can cause relaxation, how it can change your movement. You know, I'm moving a lot differently than I was sitting in the chair listening. I'm performing. I'm up here. I'm moving better. You've got to start performing a little bit and getting your body to move in a different way. Okay? So I will leave you with a picture. Oh, almost. That's our puppy. Give me a call. My cards are out there. And they have my email address. You know, just when people leave us, it's like I said, it's never the end of the chapter. We're a resources for you. Everybody is different. We can help you monitor that blood pressure. We can help you work within your activities of daily living and what's troubling you. We can guide you and the person with you. Remember, you want to be able to do as much as you can, but you want to do that safely so that the person next to you isn't worried that you're going to lose your balance. Okay, and education is key. Understand why you're doing the exercise. Understand why your posture is changing. Start to learn some anatomy with us. It can really make a difference if you understand why you're doing a certain exercise or certain movement. Okay, and with that now, there's the contact information and the resources. So I am all done. And again, thank you so much for your time. And Marissa is next up to bat to speak with you a little bit about speech and swallowing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joelle, and okay. re really appreciate it. I decided I should have been a physical therapist. Maybe I'd be skinny and could move, you know? <laughs> <She did. laughs>